Hello everyone and welcome to Tuesday Night Talk. We are in the middle of a crisis today because uh, this French band, how do they are? Uh, what is the name? It's, uh, you know... Daft Punk. Daft Punk. Daft Punk just broke up and this is a drama. And we are sending our condolences to their fans. To be serious, I am very lucky to welcome Richard Thompson. Hello, Richard. Hello. Thank you for having me here. I am the uh, lucky person. So, um, how can I introduce you? You are a musician. You manage a um, small label. Yeah, yeah, like a small bedroom label, you could say. Small bedroom label. You have been living in Latvia for 10 years? No, about. not that long. Uh, it's... Mm, let's say six years. Six years? Yeah. So you've been lying to me all this time? To well, six, six, seven years. I, I, no, I, before then I was sort of back and forth a lot between mm -hmm. Latvia and the UK. And there was like a lot of touring here when from 2011 onwards. But it was 2013 that I properly moved here. But then I moved back in 14 and then came here again in 2000, early 2015. So, yeah, a little bit of back and forth, but I'd, I'd say properly living here since 2014. 15, sorry, 2015. Is it useful to mention that your nationality is uh, British? Well, you can. You can, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think everybody who is a decent, fluent English speaker would have guessed that, but... Uh, Maybe. Yeah, but... There's it, some excellent English speakers around with with interesting accents who, who aren't British, so... I, I, I don't deny this. I don't deny this. You, you, we, uh, so, full disclosure, because this is the kind of thing that we are on YouTube, we know each other, and, uh, and, and on that topic, you remind me my, that I have some... Uh, my French accent did not disappear completely, and I accept that as a, as a, as a diplomatic... Yes. <laughs> so, um, your musical project is named Lost Arbors, you have several uh, projects right now. What is the style of music you are playing? How would you... Uh, well, in Lost Harbors, it's... Um, I, I can't really pin down the style except for saying that it has roots in folk music. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of other elements I mean uh, originally prior to Lost Harbors I was trying to do some uh, like noise project uh, but then some sort of singer songwriter kind of thing and the two kind of gelled together quite easily um, so Lost Harbors has kind of always been rooted in this requirement to write songs, yet at the same time utilize uh, sounds which you would would be more akin to like uh, a noise act, uh, such as Wolf Eyes or some sort of ambient projects, mm -hmm. um, maybe like some of Eno's uh, works like uh, On Land um, and gel those things together in some way. Uh, Maybe also influenced by post-rock? Post -rock yeah, the there was a big post-rock thing but I mean I, I think you can see those elements in someone like uh, Godspeed You Black Emperor mm -hmm. who was a very um, big influence on me like I, I'm, I was a big fan of their first three releases mm -hmm. um, where you had field recordings intermeshed with instrumental interludes um, a lot of like ambient background sounds and uh, just a lot of atmosphere in, in, in there um, and that was kind of what I was aiming for except condensed into a songwriting form um, where not necessarily the lyrics uh, had a um, like a story narrative, but mm -hmm. more of like just a, 
more of like a dreamlike attempt at guiding you into a place, into a certain headspace. Yeah, some narrative and uh, some poetry, you would say. Yeah, yeah, like quite abstract. Uh, yeah, because not not maybe uh, not getting into the trap of making experimental music for the sake of experimenting. Yeah, for about the length of uh, the tracks or just uh, because we maybe you share this feeling. You, you feel like some people are going nowhere sometimes or just it's some kind of fashion to to experiment and to just push the button for the pleasure of pushing the button but to keep some frame that uh, yeah uh, yeah and i think like having the the songwriting frame mm. helped uh, encapsulate those ideas helped me helped keep those ideas in, in into a certain um space which i could then play with you know it, it's a bit like uh, creating a toolkit for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you have the, the, the you, you could have all the tools, but I actually just wanted these tools and then that, and then you just play with them and see where that takes you. Um, I mean, in, in this specific circumstance with Lost Harbors, which is not my only musical outlet, it's just my, has been my main one for, nearly 15 years um, that's what I wanted to do originally and it's kind of still what I, I want to do with it now uh, it's just uh, yeah I play with certain emotions certain sounds certain ideas and then trying to encapsulate them in this sort of singer-songwriter uh, four to ten minute length song mm. You you mentioned Brian Eno, uh, mm. yeah. So what, what what were the artists, the band that had influence on your music? Uh, well, at the beginning, I would say like um, the Incredible String Band, um, and Six Organs of Admittance, uh, Espers. Uh, Devendra Banhart, like he was very popular in the two thousands. I remember him. Yeah, yeah I saw I, th I think one of his first shows in London. Um, just he was signed to Michael Gira's label, um, and yeah, a lot of like the American freak folk, as it was called, uh, which came about like two thousand and three. I think that's when. Roughly two thousand three, two thousand four. But it, it this is a these are explicit references. Like it could sound like uh, these artists, or but my question was uh, maybe I, larger in the sense may, maybe some bands uh, influenced you, uh, where you you have a, a real soft spot for these bands and. Um, well, then I'd definitely say Godspeed You Black Emperor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Yeah, like Eno came later. Uh, I mean, uh, really early on, like when I first started playing music, it was like Mogwai, Godspeed You, Black Emperor, Captain Beefheart, uh, The Incredible String Band, who I found like quite early on. Um, like Miles Davis, actually, the Bitches Brew album. I just adored that. I mean, I wouldn't say they had... A necessary impact on what I did with Lost Harbors, but certainly on my understanding of music, and mm -hmm. that there was more than just like this, what felt like a very narrow focused uh, concept of what interesting music was, like indie music in the UK at that time. Um, but like when it came to Lost Harbors, actually, like specifically the freak folk movement in America really opened up my ears hugely because it was the it was what was really happening at the point when I was starting to branch out into writing my own material for myself um, and in turn that then the, the people who were making that music like their influences I picked up on um, like the like late 60s early 70s folk music 
movement in the UK, the sort of psych, what we call psychoacid folk, which mm-hmm. was around in the UK and America in, in late late sixties, early seventies, which the incredible incredible string band were a part of. Um, but like Fresh Maggots, uh, kind of quite a fun, fun band from that period. Uh, Comus, who um, reformed a few like about ten years ago. Uh, yeah, like acts acts like that. That that's a lot of these things like kind of materialized to me when just after I started the idea of what I was doing. And uh then that helped like guide me. So it's like, oh, but these are like <laughs> uh touchstones that I can pull upon for, for making what I want. But I was kind of already on that path. And I actually also say like um grouper as well. Um, Liz Harris's project, which uh... a lot of bands I don't know to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, they Godspeed, of course, and Devon Drobanar also. Also, mm. and uh, when what, what what was the the moment when you decided uh, that you want to make music on your own? You just you you don't want to be only a listener or. Oh, well, maybe I need to go back to the beginning a bit there. So I started making music in 97 when a friend of mine uh, said to me, hey, I, I want to form a band. Do you want to play bass? Mm-hmm. And like he lent me his brother's bass guitar, which I had to rewire to make it work. Okay. And um, we formed a band between us. We, we had a friend who played guitar. Uh, and he was really into like Guns N' Roses and hair metal and stuff like that. And we were more into like indie rock and grunge mm-hmm. of the period, I suppose. Um, and we just started like writing some songs. And uh, that band, or rather like the, the idea of that band, lasted for quite a few years. We never ever got a gig, but we swapped loads of members. So it was just a thing that we did. You know, we went to a rehearsal studio and we made music. The music style that we made changed dramatically, as did the lineup. Um, it was always something that happened, like, you know, we'd go there every two weeks, we'd play together, write some stuff, or we'd meet around someone's house and play. But um, over like a space of five years, I was the only original member left, and we were making. Like the the sort of music we we were making went from like sounding like Counting Crows and REM to sort of like some sort of bast- why not bastardized yeah. uh, yeah. thing between Captain Beefheart and Mogwai, so it was like quite an exchange of ideas there, but it never really went anywhere, and that always kind of frustrated me a little bit because mm-hmm. you know the point of for me the point of making music forming a band was to play live go and play a gig yet we came from a very small town where the opportunities to do that were incredibly limited um, and we didn't really have much concept of a scene of musicians a band scene a music scene in our area there was some stuff happening like eight or nine miles away but we were really disconnected like we didn't have friends there we were just in this rehearsal studio Occasionally we heard some metal bands practice there, but yeah, we were very, very disconnected. And this kind of, it just didn't really strike me as the, um, as being part of a living musical culture. Although that's certainly not a concept that I could, uh, I would be able to tell you about at that point. It's Mm -hmm. just, I knew it was the missing thing. And um, that's when I I really started to think more about making my own music. Um, also, I was just a bass player, and my guitarist never let me have a go on his guitar, so I had to learn how to play guitar on my own. <laughs>
I suppose that for you being in this uh, Riga environment is something really different because maybe we share this thought. Yeah. Um, Latvia is really a great place place sorry for for music, classical and indie music. And uh, you it seems to me that you have a great great input, great insights about the history of indie music in Latvia and uh, mm, a little bit, a little bit outside. Mm, <laughs> uh, well, uh, in, in, in the radio show you are making, uh, can you remind us where, where the, the name and uh, which... it's li liminal noise uh, uh, is the name of the radio show and mm -hmm. it's on um, camp radio, which is an offshoot of uh, Camp FR, who are mm. a organization in the south of France who put on residences uh, where you get to go along and learn with, um, alongside some very interesting experimental musicians. And Liminal Noise is also the name of your label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but in this radio show, you speak a lot about. Well, Lithuanian band, Latvian band, do you, you, you... I try and connect with what's happening now. Mm. Um, not so much historically, but m more about like what is occurring right at this, this very present point. Um, as for, for my own interest on, on the whole, um, but also because I feel like a lot of uh, the music in made in these countries, which is very contemporary in many ways, doesn't um, get outside of these countries. Mm, I share absolutely what you're saying. Yeah, and yeah. people make it, but they some somehow it doesn't move beyond the immediate scene. Um, and I feel that's a bit sad. Yeah, yeah, I feel exactly the same about classical music and choir music, which is one of the specialty of Latvia. And uh, but you you know more than I do about indie music in, in, in well indie rock whatsoever you whatever you call it in 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 the Baltics. And you are absolutely right. I I don't understand why it doesn't manage to go out better and it's it's something that is seems to be deeply rooted maybe for historical or cultural reason i don't know maybe it's because it's too new or i i, I think we don't have maybe the tools exactly to understand no i mean right I've, I've got some suspicions but mm -hmm. like they're, they're just my own ideas i think one of the issues is um mm -hmm. A language barrier if you if you're making music in latvian like maybe you feel it's not translatable and and i mean there is this sort of historical context to that generally like as an englishman like when like non-english language mm -hmm. uh music coming to the english-speaking world tends to just get put into the world music uh kind of genre and that's a bit sad um, okay um but uh I, I i kind of feel that people feel that that is a barrier so they're not prepared to like overstep that um and i don't think it is a barrier i, th I think if you're making good music and interesting music you sh it should not be something that you worry about you should just go and play it to other people, and that barrier is in the is in the listener. It shouldn't be within you as the creator. Um, I think the other thing is like uh, there is always a barrier to touring stuff. I mean, obviously now we're in COVID and we can't mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get around the fact that Indeed. we can't go yeah. and tour. But prior to that, it's like the amount of um, bands that toured like i think the touring thing is very deeply rooted in maybe like um like punk and noise ethos um this sort of like just get in your car or in a bus and go to a place and play for not very much money and it, there's an expectation if you're going to tour that you should be earning a lot more 
for example, <clears throat> like the economic issues of doing it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is the infrastructure in Europe and generally worldwide. Whereas if you put in a little bit of effort and um, are creative, you can at least make the tours break even. And But it, it's it's having someone explain that to you or having that uh, idea being open to you as a musician and feeling free enough to go and do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it took me a long while to get into that mindset that I could go and do You can yeah. just go and do it. You can just email somewhere and go and play. I, I met some Latvian musician who complain about this but also i they might think that it's better somewhere else in europe but when it's not really the case uh, maybe well it can be like. yeah <laughs> <laughs> for the kind of music we are doing i suppose and um so uh, c could you speak about to, to us about a couple of bands that you uh, noticed recently that you made an article on Deep Baltics, I think, this mm. is, yeah. and where you try to get an, an overall picture of what the Latvian scene is currently and as as it it, it, it evolves. So, um, but that was made a few years ago now, though. Yeah, I, yeah, that was like three eight, that's, that article's three years old. Um, like you are some kind of ambassador for me. <laughs> I wanted you to. To make to, to you know to connect the dots maybe for the people that w who who don't know the Baltics who uh, would like to know what is happening t this this sort of feeling nothing especially well, yeah I, I think actually talking about that article is mm. w would be quite insightful in some ways because um, that article took me over a year to write mm -hmm. uh, I think it took me a year and a half like I wrote the first sketch of it and. It really goes to show how quickly things change out here because a lot of the scenes are scenes like kind of involved around True, yeah. mm. particular places. Um, for a long time, like you could say, the experimental scene was around uh, the bar called Chomsky, um, which is like a tiny four-room bar uh, which had one room with a PA system in. And you could maybe fit like 15, 16 people in there uh, at best. But actually, you know, sometimes you get a lot more. And they'd have a lot of touring bands come through there. And a lot of like Latvian artists play there as well. Um, and yeah, because there was like so much focus on that, you could go there for like I don't know, a few months, like several times a week and see a lot of very, very good music. Um but obviously there's other places as well happening. And when I was writing that article, that place was still in existence. And then they had to move the bar. And then other bars started. And it's like everything gets like spread out and things just move around. Like I think <coughs> it's always been the case here. Like, the, you know, there isn't like one place which is always been uh, the hub the focus like in for example in the uk you get like one place that's been there for like 20 30 years in a town and that's like the real focus of of the music scene and it just becomes entrenched there whereas here it's not quite so the case i mean you've got naba radio and uh Torn is the record label um who've been around for a couple of decades um but I think one of the issues is partially the movement from like the Soviet era into uh, the non-Soviet period and the kind of uh, chaotic period in the 90s and a lot of like displacement of young people as they went to find jobs uh, during the late 90s and 2000s. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of potentially like quite talented people moving away. Um, that has created a very nebulous scene in, in some ways. Um, but yeah, when I was writing the article, 
I was trying to like find stuff which had some longevity, I suppose, uh, because I didn't want to write about stuff which felt quite ephemeral, like quite like it was going to dissipate as soon as I'd written about it. But that's kind of what I end up doing anyway. Because it stops every half an hour. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I'm. Yeah, it would. It's it's impossible to follow systematically as uh, yeah a lot of things in Riga are moving really fast. Not only the music scene, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a, a feeling that you you can have about many many topics. But still, it there is a. So do you to just um, do you feel like something some atmosphere remains or some. Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I think like the the um, there's a lot of energy in 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 Riga towards uh, putting on experimental music. Like you know, there, there's a lot of there there is a core group of people who will turn up for those shows, and that group seems to be renewed um, with younger people. Which is really nice to see. Um, like I kind of feel uh, from my own experiences in my hometown in the UK, like things stagnate there uh, generation-wise, which is mm -hmm. something I don't see out here happening as much. Um, Quite healthy. Yeah, and it's it, it it makes it feel like a lot healthier, like um, because. Like the places where stuff happens are exciting, interesting places where artistic people hang out, and that is not specific to certain generations, which means that kind of everyone's invited to the party. Uh, you know, it's a playground; anybody can come and join in. Um, whereas in the UK, I kind of feel there's like a bit more of a gatekeeping atmosphere sometimes, and it's harder to get uh, a foot in the door. It's harder to start off doing things. Um, so maybe, yeah, may, maybe we can also mention that one, let's say, institution or radio that is uh, keep going on. It's uh, Nabas uh, LR six. N N Naba radio. Naba yeah. Radio. Yeah, I mean, it's a record label as well. It's part of uh, Latvian University. Um, they have a festival. <clears throat> um, they also have uh, the Hadron Award for new bands. So, you you know, as a new new band, if uh, you can go and play there and, and if you win the uh, Battle of the Bands, <laughs> so to speak, you get to play at some festivals. Um, yeah, it's... I, I think it's a great radio station and they they, they, they really support um, Latvian music but at the same time you know they, they have they play a, like a good range of um, like indie and experimental musics um, post-punk and stuff from outside of Latvia as well so it's just a really good station to tune into if you if that's what sort of stuff you dig um, and they're so well connected into the scene that it's it's uh, yeah, it's like an institution, as you said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they used to have a, a club as well, Naba Club, which unfortunately was one of these things which shut down during the period I was writing this article. So, like, yeah, I felt that felt that really like kind of encapsulated this this period of change over a couple of years where. Uh, yeah, I was writing about stuff as it was like finishing, and other things were starting up, and now now there's like a uh, this situation has occurred again. You know, like with COVID, like obviously everything's <coughs> shut now. So what's going to be there when when we we can come back and play music to to real people? 